Hi, today we're going to start talk about uh, engine starting systems. So first, what is it? We need a way to get the engine turning just fast enough so that it can run on its own. And that's what a starter is. It's a device to get the engine turning. Um, we can do that by hand with really small aircraft engines. Um, we use hand propping is what that's called. For most GA engines, we use an electric starter, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Big turbines use air-driven starters. But in all cases, we need to get the engine turning just fast enough for that four-stroke cycle to take over, and the engine can run on its own from there. So we'll start small here with hand propping. Uh, hand propping is still used on aircraft that don't have starters. A lot of the older small trainers were not equipped with an electrical system at all. J3s, Champs, T-Crafts, uh, a lot of these don't have a wire in them except for the magnetos. Usually that's confined to 85 horsepower or less, although I've prop started significantly bigger engines than that, especially some of the old radials. You need some specific training if you're going to do hand propping. Uh, this is not something that you want to figure out all by yourself. There's um, some really obvious dangers. Um, the you know you're about to start a propeller that's going to be whirling around just inches away from you, um, and so there's some, some obvious danger there. But there's some non-obvious things that can happen as well, and it really pays to have somebody that's done it a bunch before give you a hand the first couple of times. One of the most important things is that the aircraft must be controlled. The FAA says that a competent, licensed pilot needs to be on the brakes. If you're flying around in an old J3 or a T-Craft without a starter, that's not 100% practical all the time because you may out be out there solo and there may not be anybody around to help you get it started. If that's the case, then you need to tie the aircraft down, get it running, and then once it's running, you can go ahead and untie it. Again, you want to get that specific training if you're going to do this kind of operation. Most of the aircraft that we fly have what we call direct cranking starters. It's just an electric motor that engages the crankshaft to get it turning. It is by far the biggest drain on your battery, and so if the engine is not ready to start, you're probably not going to get it started before the battery dies. It only takes a few revolutions if it is ready to start, and then it should fire up and that four-stroke cycle should take over and you can disengage the starter. This is what a starter looks like. Uh, this part over here, the black cyl cylinder, is a, an electric motor, a very heavy-duty electric motor. There's a big terminal on here that to connect the battery to um, through a set of relays. Uh, when the relays are activated and you get the big current at this post, it not only starts running the starter, uh, but also um, energizes an, an electromagnet inside here to force this little gear out where you see it. Normally, when you're not starting the engine, that gear has retracted back into the housing. The reason for that is that we need that little gear to engage this really big ring gear on the crankshaft. So this shows an engine. This is the front of the engine over on this side. You can see just the edge of the wooden propeller that's attached to it. And so the crankshaft runs through this way. Here's one of the cylinders. The starter is attached to the bottom of the crank case and here's the electrical cable that's connected to it. When the pilot energizes the starter, the electricity goes in there, runs an electromagnet that shoves that gear out to engage this big ring gear, and then the electric motor turns and causes the crankshaft to turn. It's a very slow speed turn, uh, but it's just enough so that uh, we can get a few of those power strokes happening 
and the engine can take over and run on its own. When we get into bigger reciprocating engines, um, running it with an electric starter is not really practical because those engines get so big. So rather than trying to directly drive the engine, we use the electric motor to spin up a really big flywheel that has some real inertia in it. Once we get this flywheel spinning, then we engage the flywheel to the engine. And as the flywheel slows down, the engine speeds up and hopefully we can get enough revolutions out of it to start it. From a pilot point of view, um, here's what it looks like on the electrical diagram. Um, we have the uh, starter inertia motor over here and the flywheel. Um, we have the battery over here. So the first thing we need to do is turn on the master switch. That energizes this electromagnet, which is what this symbol means. And that pulls down on this plate and that completes the circuit to take the electricity over to the bus. Now the pilot moves the starter switch into the energize position. And in the energize position, it electrifies this electromagnet, which pulls down on this plate. And that allows some electricity to go over here to the starter motor. And the starter motor spins up this inertial wheel or flywheel. And you can hear that happening. It's sort of a buzzing sound. And, and you hold that up for maybe five, 10 seconds until you hear it really spinning. And then you can turn that switch off. Um, that deactivates this relay. And now that flywheel is out there spinning at really high RPM all by itself. And we move the switch into the other position usually labeled mesh. When we move it into the mesh position, an electromagnet moves that flywheel and it engages it to the engine so that the through a clutch so that the engine speeds up as the flywheel slows down. Hopefully we get enough revolutions out of it to get the four stroke cycle to take over and then the pilot can release the switch. Hopefully the engine is running at that point. There's a good chance you'll never run into an inertia starting system in your career unless you get into flying antique warbirds or something like that because they are mostly found on big radial engines. Starter generators is another way to do it. They're very similar to the direct drive starter except that the starter generator is always engaged to the engine. You don't have the little impinging gear to worry about. Starter generators are cool because the same unit can be used for both spinning the engine to get it started and generating electricity afterwards. So it saves a little weight that way. These are usually really heavy duty because they have to run uh, for a good 30 to 60 seconds to get a turbine engine started. Um, this diagram shows a typical starting sequence for a gas turbine engine, like you might find in a Jet Ranger or on a King Air or something like that. Um, we start the ignition process and that starter generator starts turning the engine and the RPM starts picking up. Um, at somewhere around 15%, we throw in some fuel and light it. Um, and so the, the engine lights up, but the starter has to keep helping the engine. If you tried to let the engine run itself at, at that speed, it would overheat. And so that starter motor continues to run all the way up until the ignition is off. And then we finally let the starter off just below a full-blown idle RPM, which is typically around 50% of the maximum RPM. So once again, this can take up to a full minute to get done. So you need a unit that can handle running hard for that long without overheating. Usually, if you have to make multiple attempts to start the engine with one of these, 
um, there's this, some hard limitations on how long you can crank before you have to give it a cool off period. For bigger turbine engines, even a starter generator is not going to do it for you. And so we have to use air powered turbine starters. Uh, and so the way these work is there's compressed air um, that is that is blown through the turbine, a, a small turbine, uh, which is geared to the big turbine engine. Um, we use typically compressed uh, bleed air uh, to get this done. Bleed air is not at a very high pressure, it's something like 30 to 60 psi, but there's a very large volume of it. Um, and we can get that bleed air from the APU, the auxiliary power unit, from a ground power unit or GPU. Those are small turbine engines that have big compressors on them and can supply us with a lot of compressed air. Or if we have one of our other engines operating already, we can take bleed air from that engine to start the next engine. This is a diagram out of your book showing how we take that bleed air and, uh, and then run it down into the uh, engine air starter turbine to get that big engine started. And here's a blow up of that little uh, air turbine starter. We have uh, the air coming in from this direction and it runs over these little turbine vanes and then out overboard. Those turbine vanes are, as you can see, hooked to a bunch of gears that eventually run this output drive shaft that will turn your big turbine engine. Regardless of which system you use, all starters, it's important to understand how they work. You have to be knowledgeable, especially about the limitations. Even the little direct drive starters we use on 152s have some cranking limitations on them that you can find in the POH. After so many minutes of cranking, you have to give it so many minutes of cool down so that you don't overheat the unit. The second thing to remember is you need to have your engine ready to start. Don't just start cranking and then think about whether it needs a prime or not because you'll waste too much battery that way. We only put in batteries that are just barely big enough to start the engine because they're so heavy. Uh, so you can't afford to mess around too much. You need to think in advance and have your engine ready. And then the third thing to remember is to be safe. Um, there's a reason why we yell clear prop out the window before we turn that key. A lot of people have been hurt over the years. Give it just a second after you yell clear prop, as that gives people an opportunity to yell back at you if there's something wrong. For instance, maybe you left the tow bar on the nose wheel and it's about to get chopped up by the propeller or something like that. Also, think about what's around you, especially behind you. When you start that engine, um, you don't want to be the guy that's blowing a bunch of dirt into the maintenance hangar. That really upsets people when you do that. And then once you are finished starting, make sure that the system has disengaged, because if it stays engaged after starting, it's going to damage the system. Again, the important thing is that you understand the specific system on your aircraft, so make sure you spend some time in the POH and learn the details about your starting system.